Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. In the summer of 1960, 19-year-old Sandy Greenberg, the son of a Buffalo, New York junk dealer, was home on break between his sophomore and junior years at Columbia University. Sandy, who loved sports, also loved learning and was very excited about his future and the possibilities that lay ahead. However, while pitching in a baseball game that summer, Sandy's vision suddenly became cloudy, requiring him to leave the game after almost hitting a batter. Sandy didn't know it then, but eye disease and a misdiagnosis would soon lead to complete blindness. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we'll be speaking with author, entrepreneur, investor, and inventor, Sandy Greenberg. Sandy will talk about his book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, which tells his story of how he went from despair to a life of hope, love, and gratitude. Sandy will share stories about special people in his life who helped him and believed in him, especially his wife Sue, and his college roommate and dear friend Art Garfunkel, who he affectionately calls Arthur. Sandy and his wife Sue are founders of End Blindness, a prize created to advance groundbreaking scientific and medical research to end blindness permanently and for everyone. I'd now like to welcome Sandy Greenberg to our show. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm very excited to have you on the show. I have just finished your book, Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend, and I have spent a couple of weeks immersed in your story. And I tell you, I just felt so riveted by the events in your life and the different people who came in and out and the challenges and the successes that you've had. It's such an honor to be able to speak with you, Sandy. So let me start by asking you, you grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I want you to sort of give a little bit of a description of what it was like growing up in Buffalo and who were some of the key influential people in your life during that time? Well, I was born in a poor neighborhood in Buffalo. And although we lived in a rather flimsy wooden home, I was blessed by having four indomitable people who helped me get through this in a in as wonderful a way that, that you could, particularly impressing upon me the importance of leading a good, decent, moral life. And these four people, one of whom was my father, who came over from Nazi Germany in the late 30s, subsequently married uh, my mother, and he and I had, although a short period of time together, it was quite sweet. One day he took a stick of chewing gum and put it above my head and dropped it and said, it's coming from heaven. Now those sweet memories vanished quite quickly because he died when I was five. Oh. And his death devastated me. Moreover, he left my mother, Sarah, with $54 to raise three children under the age of five. Then there was my grandmother who left Poland when she was eight years old. She was babysitting one night and a spring from a cradle broke and burst into her eye, causing her to have a glass eye. She moved to London where she operated a candy store and then this incredibly wonderful woman who was ill for most of her life managed to get across this cruel ocean by herself until she got to Philadelphia and then ultimately Buffalo, New York. I wanted to ask you about your, your grandmother. You gave her the nickname of Bub. 
Yes. <laughs> Very fondly, you spoke of her. You seem to, it was almost like her presence had this power that just did something to you. What, tell us more about that. You're very insightful because that power was immense. Being with her was almost as though you were being anointed. And also to be with her sort of felt as though you weren't worthy of, of being there. She was such a towering presence in, in our lives. When she died, she took something sacred from me, but also left something sacred behind as well. I wish I could describe her to you in, in greater detail. Well, in the book, you do a very good job because I, I was getting a real sense that she was just one of those people. It was her, her wisdom, her presence. Uh, uh, she actually spoke often or maybe even entirely in Yiddish, didn't she? Yes, she did. Yiddish. Uh, and do you un did you understand Yiddish? Yes, I did. Doing that as a little boy. Uh, okay. Now, it was important to have her there also as uh, with your dad having passed. Now, this was back in the early to mid 40s, was this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Early to mid 40s. She was definitely a, a power and your, and your mom as well. But after your dad passed away, your mom remarried. Is that correct? Yes. Several years later, uh, she married my. Uh, father's brother, my uncle, Carl, who was another extraordinary human being. He was a junk dealer in Buffalo, particularly during the winters, was very foreboding. It was a terrible place to work, but he did it seven days a week. He brought his entire family over from Europe and took care of them so long as he could during the course of his lifetime and was as good a father as you could get. And it was not in any of the sermonizing that he did or any of the advice or guidance. It was simply enough to just watch him and to see how he led his life. The physical strength and the moral strength were simply very impressive. Anyone who came to him to have him sign on the purchase of a house, he would be there. He would do it often when he couldn't afford it. You also worked with him a little bit too. Some of the descriptions, yeah. was, it was pretty rough. You got pretty banged up <laughs> yeah. dealing in junk, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, uh, it was different from going to college. I'll tell you that. Th that's part of why I respected him so much because I saw the way in which he moved around the junkyard, the people he had to deal with, the enormous set of problems that confronted him on a daily basis. And then to do this in seven degree weather in Buffalo was quite a challenge. Yeah, I, I live in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. So we, we get some pretty rough winters, but nothing compared to Buffalo, <laughs> I guess. Wow. I, I'm picturing, you know, freezing cold weather and carting around junk and metal things and getting your fingers smashed and all that. It must have been a, a real character building exercise, would you say, Sandy? Yeah, if, if you call it that, yeah. <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was definitely a recognition that there's another side to the world because I had grown up and somewhat studious and liked to read and study the Bible and literature of all sorts. And this was quite a, an awakening to see how a good portion of the world must live like the hard, oppressive labor that so many people have to do to get by. Yes, that yeah, that is for sure. And you talk about academics, but you also love sports. Sports was a big part of your life as a kid, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Every night I was playing either in school or at home and um, couldn't get enough of it, really. Basketball, baseball, ice hockey when we had a chance. Yeah. So now you had the family was together. Your uncle had uh, had married your mom. He was a good provider. Uh, yes, he was. Worked hard. You know, instilled in you a lot of good stuff. You had your grandmother there. 
So you talked about academics, very important to you. You know, I think of myself as a little kid and I, you know, I loved history. I was very interested in history, but school in general was something that was like, oh, I, I got to get through it as opposed to, I got to absorb all this, you know, tell us about the academic part of your life and, and what eventually led you to go to Columbia? Interesting. As you might have garnered, I was raised in a somewhat religious home. Mm -hmm. And I had decided to go to the Jewish Theological Seminary. But there were some people at school who persuaded me that I ought to go to Columbia instead. And so thinking I was quite clever, I said, well, why? I said, why don't I just combine the two and go to both places in the joint program? Mm -hmm. Well, I was on my way toward doing that when Columbia just swept me away into a secular world I could never have dreamed of. I was initiated into the most treasured secrets of knowledge from across the millennia and across time. Wow. And so you made the decision to go to Columbia. Yes. And we'll talk about your experience there in a second. But I, I want to back up because there's a very important part of your early days in Buffalo that I don't want to skip over. And <laughs> that was this young girl that you seem to have a, a, a real fascination and attraction to. And her name was Sue. Could you tell us about your earlier crush that you had on her and how did that progress? Slowly at best. <laughs> this was a new school. We had just moved because of my uh, father, Carl, been able to move into a, a decent neighborhood, different from the one which we grew up. And I walked in the first day to this school, public school 66. And I stared across the room and I saw this incredible young woman that I couldn't believe I was seeing. And she sat across from me and I couldn't keep my eyes off of her. But she never paid any attention to me. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> it was, but then this persisted in sixth grade and seventh grade and in eighth grade. So it was pretty frustrating. But then in eighth grade, I had a break. And that is, there was a spelling bee that the Buffalo Evening News held. And Sue and I turned out to be the two finalists and the word the tiebreaker was going to be silhouette. And I decided that I didn't want to spell it incorrectly as a token of my admiration to her. So I spelled it properly. And then she spelled it incorrectly. And there was a little bit of tension in my body trying to figure out whether there was a good thing or a bad thing in terms of <laughs> a relationship. It turned out that she gained a little more respect for me. And we then went off together to high school, where in my sophomore year, I was able to get up enough courage to ask her out on a date. Uh, happy ending. Though. So two things when I was reading that part. One is when I saw what the word was, silhouette. I moved the book out of my sight and I tried to spell silhouette and I couldn't think of how to spell it. So, uh, and I'm pretty good at spelling. So congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a, I was expecting you to congratulate me decades ago, but I'll, it was worth waiting, James. <laughs> Terrific. And the, the other thing is that I was thinking, gee, because I'm not sure I, I knew at that point in the book, you know, what, what your future was going to be there with Sue. And I was wondering if that was a good move or not, to whether you should have just thrown it and uh, missed it. Absolutely. I was torn between doing that and spelling it right. You chose wisely. As it turns out, you never know. <laughs> You're okay. right. You're right. So so you move on to Columbia. So you're you're leaving Buffalo and even though it's in the same state, it's pretty far away. Yes, going down to uh, down to New York City. 
So tell me about Colombia and and you you mentioned that this opened up this whole vast treasure trove of knowledge there. But talk to me a little bit about what what that was like and where did you think you were going with school? What was your goal? Well, I I had hoped that uh, after college I would go to law school and after that get involved in some form of public service because I was raised on the notion that uh, our family, like many others, owes a particular debt of gratitude to this country Mm. for not only saving us, but enabling us to lead a life of great, and I use this word specifically, great nobility. And we could never be thankful enough. To this day, I still am blessing this country for for what they afforded my family. That was the goal. And then you started meeting people there, and you you were thoroughly enjoying your experience. You were sort of, you weren't just like getting through. I'm sure the work at Columbia is incredibly uh, difficult, and there's a lot of it. But it, so- it sounded to me like you were just sort of like wringing everything out of it you could. You were just thoroughly enjoying it, weren't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, perhaps one of the primary reasons is that the passion, the infectious passion that the faculty had, I had never seen anything like it. We could sit and talk with virtually any professor for as long as you wanted, and you could tell the depth of their knowledge and their appreciation of that knowledge. It was just uh, magnificent. Of course, coming from Buffalo, New York, I had no idea that there could be a place like this. And while you were there, besides the professors, you met some interesting students. And there's there's one one particular student who you ended up rooming with, right? Could you tell us about that person? Uh, that person was a guy named Arthur Garfunkel. And he was dressed as a typical Ivy Leaguer. But there was something special about the way he came over to me and shook my hand. He was very intriguing. And particularly on one day, when we came out of humanities class together and he asked me to look at a patch of grass, which I didn't know what to make of that. And I looked at this measly patch of grass and he described how the light shone the beauty and complexity of the grass itself, its colors, etc. And I have to tell you that I was 17 years old I was from Buffalo, New York, and I had not ever been inducted to a place where simple nature could change the way in which you looked at the world. And from that moment on, I experienced life differently because of that patch of grass. It literally opened my eyes so that I could see the beauty in nature. And obviously, Arthur and I kept this to ourselves because the other fellows would uh, consider us not regular people. We would be mocked and avoided. So this was our, our secret world. And it was populated by exciting trips to the museums, to the concert halls, to the galleries, to the places that few people in the world really got to see. That's so wonderful because I'm in my 60s now and you know life is still busy. Things are happening all the time and you know you've heard the term, you know, stop and smell the roses. Yeah. Uh, it, there's so much to, to be said about that because I don't remember the last time I, you know, stopped and smelled the roses. When I read that part about Arthur stopping and pointing out a patch of grass, I thought to myself, at first I'm like, what, what, what about a patch of grass? But then I, I'm realizing 
you know, you're just contemplating the present, being fully present and looking at nature and and stopping just to think about it. And it opens up a whole new dimension of your imagination and all your senses, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Absolutely right. And of course, Arthur Garfunkel, Art Garfunkel, Simon Garfunkel, was such is such a talented, amazing man and a beautiful singer, and his music is wonderful. So you probably had no idea at that point in time that he was going to go in that direction, but he sort of changed your life. Totally changed my life. Wow. And now I want to bring us to another life change. And this, of course, now the two of you ended up rooming together, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And that was your sophomore year, I think it was in college. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, between your sophomore and junior year at Columbia, you went home for the summer. What happened that summer? Could you give us a summary of that? Well, it wasn't pretty. I was pitching in a baseball game, and in the seventh inning, my eyes became very cloudy, steamy, as though I were in an intense steam shower. And uh, I almost hit a batter, and I had to leave. And so I stumbled to the sidelines and dropped to the ground. And it turns out Sue happened to be at the game, and she came over, and I remember putting my had on her lap. Mm. I mean, what happened? And I told her I didn't know, except that I couldn't see for a while. But that was the first in a series of events that would ultimately lead to my uh, complete blindness. Oh boy! I, yeah, I, I, I was trying to imagine the sort of the terror you had. Probably first confusion, like was there something that can be fixed. And I know you went some uh, through a process of some doctors and uh, you did, but you did go back to Columbia to start your junior year. So how were you dealing with it at that point? You didn't really quite know what was going on with your eyes then, did you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was madness because of my other roommate, Jerry Spire and uh, Arthur could see how I was failing each day to get around our room and campus. So they didn't really know what to do. Arthur took to making fun of it, which is typical Arthur. <laughs> he, has, he has a very strange sense of humor, which I adore. So despite that, it uh, meant that I was continuing to, I hate to be traumatic, but to drown, mm. not see any way out. It was the first day of final exams. Arthur took me to the gymnasium. And I sat down in my chair and I was able to see part of the essay question. And I started writing on the blue book, not being concerned about any lines or pretty way to mark up the book. About an hour later, I looked down at my watch. The last thing I saw was 10 o'clock. Mm. And then I saw nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I sat in my chair and I rubbed my eyes and I blinked, twisted in my chair until finally I got the message that this wasn't going to change. So I took my blue book and I stumbled to the front of the room and I handed my blue book to the proctor who said, son, are you sure you want to give me this? I've never seen anything like this before. You're turning in your exam because you can't see? That's ridiculous. I said, sir, I need to get back to my dorm room. Can you help me out? And he sort of ignored me. And I finally stumbled back to get my coat, my chair, when he realized that I was being quite serious. And I got back to my dorm room and, and packed up. I got on the train for eight long hours, in which I sat alone. And in fact, that was one of the most haunting periods of my life. And I opened the book with that scene, as you know. Yes. 
what are you, 19 at this point, 19 or 20 years old? 19. Yeah, 19. So, you know, I'm thinking about the normal test anxiety in college with those blue books and sitting in the big auditoriums or the gyms and, and yeah. trying to remember everything that you've studied. And on top of that, now what's going on with my eyes? There's something really, really wrong. You're in your own head now. What's going on? So you got back home. And then what happened when you got home? Well, the first thing that gave me away was I sat down at the kitchen table and was about to tell my mother what had happened. And she put a glass of milk down on the kitchen table and my hand and missed it. And she then expressed such a level of concern that I really just sat down and told her the whole story that we had to get to my doctor. Unfortunately, it was the wrong doctor because this is the same person who had been giving me steroids, topical steroids, which actually corrupted my eyes and um, poisoned them so that latent glaucoma that was existing there came to the fore and simply destroyed my optic nerve. Oh, Sandy. Oh, my goodness. And you did end up going to see another doctor, I believe it was a, was a surgeon out in Detroit. And, and what happened there with that? Yeah, well, he was Dr. Saul Schuer in Detroit Sinai Hospital. I came up to see him in the late afternoon of the cold Detroit day. He put me on an electric tonograph table where he noticed the eye pressure my eyes were so high that he started screaming, why did they wait so long? Why did they wait so long? Which, of course, meant nothing to my mother and to me. Who were, were they? And what did they wait so long to do? And then he sat me down and examined my eyes with his ophthalmoscope. Now, mind you, my mother is sitting to the right of me on a hard wooden chair and examined my eyes and stood up slowly and said, well, son, you're going to be blind tomorrow. Oh, wow. What a punch in the gut. Oh, my goodness. You know, one question I did have reading the book, when he said that you're going to be blind tomorrow, why was he saying you're going to be blind tomorrow? Could you explain that? Finality. Oh. That was the killer word. You're going to be blind and maybe we can resurrect you. No, you're going to be blind tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Oh, your life is upside down, turned right upside down. Yes, it did. Yeah, for me. Yes, it did. Mm. All those plans, all, all those things that are in your head, all those important things changed. Changed completely. But the biggest pain in that little room was to watch my mother hear this news at the same time I did from this doctor who we knew there was no appeal beyond Dr. Schiller. If he had said something, then we knew that was the truth. And so it was. He did do surgery on your eyes. Yes. That was just to protect your physical eyeballs, not your Yes, vision. yes, yes. And that was it. I mean, once he did that procedure, that sort of it sounded like it sort of really sort of terminated the vision uh, to protect your, your eyeballs, but the vision was going to be terminated anyway. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I felt like reading the book, I just felt like I was with you in, in that process with you and your family. It was such a, a turbulent time. I mean, you can, you came home now you had to reconcile this whole thing. Can you give us a, just a little flavor? It, it'd be really hard to, encapsulated into a little tiny story, but what was the process you went through to decide what was going to happen next in your life? When I returned to Buffalo after the Detroit surgery, in those days, I, I don't think any of my colleagues and I understood what the word depression meant. I'm sure more sophisticated people did. So uh, let's say I was in despair or down and saw no future. Mm. So I would not see anybody. 
a lot of my friends from high school wanted to come over and I said no. And then suddenly bursting through the front door was Arthur. He had flown up from New York, despite the fact that I asked him and anybody else I could talk to not to come. So there were some awkward moments. And finally he said, Sanford, let's take a walk. So we walked down the avenue and the conversation started out somewhat lightly. And then he snapped about a quarter of the way through. He said, so Sanford, tell me, when are you coming back? I said, what are you talking about, Arthur? I'm not coming back. I can't come back. Can't you see this? I can't see it. And then Arthur started talking about what I consider to be philosophy. And I said, here is this guy talking philosophy, and I'm dying. Mm. So I, I didn't listen to him very much. And as we kept walking, he tried to persuade me that I had no choice but to come back. And the thing that tore at me the most was when he said, it's not that you have to come back for yourself, Sanford. You've got to come back for me. Wow. And um, I realized, and what he was referring to was the compact he and I had made before we roomed together, that one would be there for the other in times of crisis. Mm. And uh, what needed to be done was to talk to Sue. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the most difficult was to talk to my family and tell them that I was going back to the university, which they were violently opposed to. Yeah, that was kind of an intense scene with your with your dad because he, you know, I could feel their pain too because they were worried about you. They thought, you know, you're going down to Man I mean, Manhattan's an easy place to get hurt. If you're not paying attention, if you're a sighted person. You got it. That's what was concerning them. Wow. That was intense. And that decision to go back. And it's one thing to make that decision, but then reality was here you're plopped back into Columbia, New York City, or away from the familiar. I mean, yeah, you'd been there two years, but it's not like being back in Buffalo where you knew pretty much every Every turn around the place, you know? Yeah. Wow. So here's the point where this really impacted me that you had to figure out how to do your new life while being in the midst of one of the most competitive universities in the world, really balancing those two things. You had to depend on people, didn't you? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I, I was very fortunate to have made a number of friends during the first two years of schooling. And I would ask them if they would come in for half an hour, an hour a week and read to me. And then I would also ask my professors if they knew of any students who might be interested. And there were people who volunteered and that made it possible. Of course, the primary person was Arthur. Mm. When others didn't show, he was there, morning, noon, and night. He walked me around the city wherever I had to go, took me to the library, took me to my classes. What he did was really beyond scale or measure. There is no way that I could ever repay him. It's a debt that I have that I'll never be able to repay. That's so it's so moving because I'm thinking this, you're trying to reconcile your whole life. Now you're blind. You've, you've lost your sight. You're trying to pick up where you left off with a whole group of different ground rules to abide by. And here, you know, Arthur's, you're getting all this other help as well, but Arthur's sort of, he's your rock. He's, he's pulling you through this, but I would imagine that Arthur had some of his own studies to contend with. As well. <laughs> How did he do that? You picked out the right issue. He was an architecture student. An architecture student at Columbia was very, very rigorous. And he was working an awful lot of the time. 
And yet he turned his life around so that it would accommodate my schedule. This is what makes the friendship unbelievable. And writing this book was in part to say thank you to the two people who rescued me because they sure did. And I would have had no semblance of any reasonable life without the two of them. And Sue was behind you this this whole time. She was supporting you because it was a game changer for her as, as well, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's amazing. So she's back in Buffalo still yep. at this point while you're down in, in Columbia. Now, people just got to get the book and read it. It's just, it's just fantastic. But just to sort of bring us to another level here, you were talking to some people, some social workers and things like that. People were trying to get you to, to readjust your thinking about not having your eyesight. And they talked about canes. They talked about seeing eye dogs and, and all these different things. And, but you were struggling with that, weren't you? And, and what was it ultimately that got you on a uh, sort of an upward into the right path? Well, I know this sounds, I don't know what it sounds like, but the fact is that I felt that if I had to give up my independence and my freedom and yield to a dog or cane, that a lot of my dignity would be stripped away from me. Mm. And that was intolerable. Mm. So I decided not to use a cane or a dog. And all the professional people that I saw were furious at me. That's where you were, uh, you, you make note in the book, you were getting a lot of bumps and bruises and scrapes, weren't you? Yeah, still do. <laughs> you still do, yeah. I mean, first of all, I would get lost in, in Manhattan now, you know, very easily, even though the streets are numbered. <laughs> and I, I only live 18 miles away from New York City, but I'm picturing you. You were still depending on on people, though. Yes, yes. You didn't have the cane and you didn't have the, the dog, but you were depending heavily on people. And I know that was the that was the rub with the, the social worker person that used to be depending on people. Absolutely. But let's get back to Arthur and a little trip you took um, in New York City that sort of changed things. Yeah. Well, after one of these meetings I had with the social worker, Arthur had always taken me there and then taken me back to our dorm room. This time, when I left the meeting, Arthur pulled me over and said, Sanford, I have a sketch of the Seaburn building that's due tomorrow morning. So here's what I'm suggesting. You come with me. It won't take that long. I'll do it, then I'll get you back to the door. I said, Arthur, I don't think you understand. If I don't get back there, my career is doomed because this is the way in which I view the world. If I missed a reader, I was finished. Mm. And he said, no, it won't take that long, I can assure you. And I said, no, I, I can't do that. I, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. But I just said I wouldn't do it. And so Arthur turned around and walked away, leaving me alone on Broadway during rush hour. So I was left with no choice but to get back to Columbia. I had, I remember uh, Michael New Casey was my reader who was going to come and see me at four o'clock. And I was intent on getting back there. And I got to the subway. That whole episode in my life was the most frightening nightmare I could conceive of. I was alone and blind, rush hour, in Grand Central Station. Mm. And so I just ran and fell and scraped and did everything you might imagine a blind person running through Russia on the Grand Central Station would do. At one point, I had fallen over on the side of the track, and the train was going to be coming soon. I think for the first time in my life, I was hoping to be severed mm. by the train so that this tire mockery that I was living would come to an end. And then I realized that Arthur and Sue and my friends counted on me 
not for telling them how difficult this was, but for just living with it without talking about it. Mm. Exactly. And so I got up, got back onto the shuttle to go across town to take the train back up to 116th and Broadway. And that trip persuaded me that if I could get through the New York City subway system blind, then I could probably do anything I wanted to. Yeah, definitely. But you had a surprise, didn't you, when you finally reached your goal of getting back to Columbia? Yes. The surprise, <laughs> I bumped into a man who said, oops, excuse me, sir. And in that one instant, I knew it was Arthur's voice. And for, I don't know, a few seconds, I was simply enraged. I just couldn't believe he had done this to me. And then it became very clear what he had done was to prove to me that I could do this. Mm. And that episode defined me then and it defines me today. So he, he was by you that time. He just let you do it, though. My wife, Sue, still doesn't forgive him. <laughs> He said, Arthur, you could have killed the guy. And I said, no, I was really watching him carefully. Oh, man, what a friend. So he took so the whole thing about him and his appointment and sketching the building was all just a baloney story. It was baloney just so he could really, really help his friend. That is absolutely correct. What an amazing friend. And what an amazing Sandy to do that trip on your own and I mean, I was with you in that story. I mean, I, I felt, I think my shins are still bothering me. <laughs> no, so good. Look, you know very well that you do things when you don't have choices. Yes. Or at least you perceive you don't have choices. And of course, I could have made it much easier by just going with Arthur. But I decided, no, I had to get back. I had to get back. Well, that, that was such an amazing story. And just one thing, I think it's important because the name of your book is Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. In your book, you talk a little bit about how Arthur was helping you and how you, how you, I think, how you came about the title. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Well, as I said to you, Arthur has a very skewed sense of humor, <laughs> at least during many of the times we were together. And so he came to coming into the room with the book. He'd walk in and he'd say, Sanford, darkness is going to read to you now. Mm. Or Sanford, darkness is going to read the Iliad for you now. So he became darkness to me. I suppose he meant that it was his way of being in the darkness with me. But that's when he became, hello, darkness, my old friend, having nothing to do with the song. That's unbelievable. What an amazing story. And now you end up doing very well at Columbia. You go on to uh, Oxford and uh, get a graduate degree from Harvard. And you and Sue get married. The dream comes true. Yeah. <laughs> so there she is with you. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. The dream came true. I still consider myself to be the luckiest man in the world. If you read this story, you can't help but be persuaded that this man got far more than he deserved. And it sounded like you guys were working hard and uh, so much was going on, but then this incredible opportunity. I'm a big history buff and I love stories about presidents and learning more about them, but you go to the White House as a fellow in the Johnson administration. I, I th just thought that was so cool that you had that experience and all the different people you met. What was it like working with Lyndon Johnson? It was a stunning experience, one that is very difficult to define in a short period of time. But here's what impressed me most about President Johnson. He was a rural conservative who came and did more for urban dwellers than any other president. Now, it is true, of course, that he bobbled the war. Right. 
which is a permanent tragedy and blight on the face of America. But he also did so much good for so many millions of people that uh, I was proud to know him and be affiliated with him. He was quite the, the character. I mean, he was a, he was a colorful person from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> some colorful language that he used and yeah. um, he was a he was a big presence as a matter of fact you say in your book you were tall right sandy you're pretty yeah. tall six two yeah yeah well he he was taller than you in the picture yeah. that i saw in the book so he was a he was just a big a big man big guy yeah so it was i guess you had to be on your toes when you worked <laughs> as a colorful at the white house is that an understatement yeah you got it <laughs> literally and figuratively <laughs> literally and figuratively that's correct but it, it was an experience of a lifetime you can imagine what it was like and in the 60s there was enough turmoil going on in the world that uh, trying to keep your bearings and go through school and work in the white house it was a it was a trying time but very 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 well worth every minute I bet. I also, in the book, I noticed there's a photograph of you with uh, then Vice President Hubert Humphrey. I just have to pause here for a second, because when I was 10 years old, I was in fifth grade. We actually had our, a little presidential debate done in our classroom, and I was on the Hubert H. Humphrey debating team. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's an honor. Wasn't it an honor? I, I don't know why I, I decided on Hubert Humphrey, but I did. I liked him. He was a great, great human being mm. through and through. There was nothing deceitful. There wasn't a petty bone in his body. He cared deeply about other human beings and their suffering. And he worked assiduously to try and accomplish legislation that would help those people who were less well off and others. But I, I am so admiring of him that I still maintain only the fondest memories of what he did and what I saw him do every day. I remember I had my whole list of reasons why people should should vote because we had a little election. Yeah, I think there were when we started, there was like 20 for Richard Nixon and two for Hubert Humphrey and, and the two were on the debating team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh God, twenty for Nixon and two for Humphrey. Yes, that was it. So after my stellar debating skills, we brought one person over to our side. Wow, that's an accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. I still have the my H H H button and my hum Humphrey Muskie button. I still have somewhere in my attic, but. Uh, Oh, I really remember that. But I did when I saw the picture of him, I said, I've got to ask Sandy about Hubert Humphrey. I'm so glad that you have those memories of him. That's terrific. He was a wonderful, wonderful guy. So let's go on from there. So you so you got your graduate degrees in government, right? Yeah, I got a, I got an MBA from Columbia as well. Okay. Got my master's and PhD at Harvard, and then I went on a Marshall Scholarship to Oxford. And then when I came back, I got my MBA from Columbus. Just an amazing uh, accomplishment. And I know you loved learning. You weren't just collecting degrees for the sake of collecting degrees. You were just absorbing every experience and every bit of knowledge that you could. And then you started giving back. You have been a successful entrepreneur, investor. You actually invented a speech compression machine. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. When I was a senior year, having returned as a blind student, I would have to listen to tape recordings that would speak to me at 150 words a minute, which is about the rate you and I are speaking at now. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was difficult to keep up with your sighted colleagues who were reading at two or three or four hundred words a minute. And so I decided to invent a machine that would permit people to listen at far greater rates without distortion so they could comprehend it. 
That's what I did. It took me a number of years. I worked on it all the time. I was at Harvard and Oxford. In 1969, I received the patents for the uh, compressed speech machine. And what's amazing, and I think you even say it in the book, is you're, you were, even though you were more than competent in the sciences, that wasn't your area of, uh, sure. of interest. <laughs> and yet you invented a machine and you patented it. Yeah, it took many hours, but also two things. When I was at Columbia, I took a physics course with Leon Letterman, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the neutrino. And that gave me an intellectual platform upon which to build my scientific interests. And when I came up to Harvard, many of the people who read to me were physicists and engineers. So I got a lot of help all during those years until I got the patent. Yeah, well, I'm sure that's helped an awful lot of people. And I know you did some work with some databases uh, for uh, tracking the efficacy of antibiotics. Yep. Uh, which I'm sure, again, a, a huge, a huge help for research, I'm sure. Terrific that you've, you've always, always been giving back since in, in everything you do. But just to, to move on, there was a part of the book that I just, I, I just love the way you, you moved from sort of telling this story of your, your sort of your biography of what happened, different events and challenges and all that. But then you, you start to get very reflective very reflective and uh, you write beautifully and you talk about your family growing up, your children, uh, your wife, you're describing what things look like. And I just thought it was so wonderful. You were, you were sort of recounting how they looked and these camping trips you took and, and Arthur came along as well on some of them. And it was wonderful. But then you get to a point where you, you talk about a balance sheet. You talk about a balance sheet of those things that were good, that you were blessed with, and other things that were difficult for you and your family. Could you touch on that a bit? Yeah. I think the fundamental point, without getting into too much detail, is that if I were to tell you that there is this 19-year-old kid who went blind, has no money, and... Uh, He's in college, and I want you to invest in him. I suspect there wouldn't be too many people offering to invest. So I know very well that my story statistically was impossible to have been written or have lived. And when I look back at it and I see the incredible good fortune I have had the assets so far outweigh whatever liabilities, whatever debits there are, that every day of my life makes me feel good and proud of all the things that I've done with the help of others, with the help of others, and for having been blessed to live in a country like this and have had the opportunities. My mentor was David Rockefeller. Why? He became my mentor. I don't know, but he did. We became very, very close friends over the decades. And we've talked about Sue and Arthur, so many others that stopped along the road, took out time to help me out. What accounts for that? I, I have no idea. I just know that I was the beneficiary of all this goodness that was stacked up in my favor. I'll tell you, Sandy, what I read in your book was gratitude, gratitude. And yet many people would might read the book and say, oh, what's he grateful for? Look at what a bad deal he got. What an awful, you know, the doctor fumbled the ball and he, what a, he, he could have done this. That. And, the, and the gratitude that you had and, and the achievement that you had and the friends that you developed and the experience that you you had is just, it's just so awesome. I was, I got to say this. I was sad when I, when I read the epilogue and the book was done. <laughs> and granted, granted, I was, I was happy I finished it because I had a, an interview with you the next day. <laughs> right. 
But in a way, I was kind of sad it was over because I felt like I got to know you. I was part of your adventure and part of your experience. And speaking of experiences, and this is the part that I really got engaged in, and I'm going to read that part of the book over again. You talk about your imagination, your memory, and the experiences that you've had, and this sort of almost extra dimension of senses that you've developed not having your vision. I mean, I'm, I'm a sighted person, but tell me, what is that experience of not having sight? What, are, what is that extra dimension that you're sort of painting in your book? I don't know how it happened, but for sure, I, I'll give you an example. We've been attending the World Economic Forum for many, many years. And about 10 years ago, they had a session called Dialogue in the Dark. And they took all these CEOs and potentates and put them in a pitch black room mm. for an hour. And they couldn't see a damn thing. At the end of it, they all came out and they were all humbled, frightened, said it was a terrible experience. I never want to go through it again. Mm. And I was sort of on the side, not not laughing, but just taking in the reactions. Because to me, and Sue wanted to go, so we did. Uh, to me, it was just a busman's holiday. So, <laughs> but I went, and uh, this reporter from the German Financial Times comes over to me and says, so tell me, what what's your story? And I said, well, you know, this blindness thing isn't as bad as you might think it is because as an example when you're walking along the street you're seeing garbage containers and cracks in the sidewalk and all sorts of ugly things when i'm walking along the street i don't have any distractions so i'm thinking of creating new enterprises as i walk along and that's the truth my world is free from clutter and I am able to tinker with crazy ideas, some sane, but to, to have a level of freedom that is unimaginable. No limits, no horizons, just your mind and the universe. And that's what you got. That's why I'm going to read it again because it was just, it was so, I don't know, it just it made me think deeper than, than I've thought in a long time. And in a different way, it kind of brought me back to what Arthur said about that patch of grass. Yes. Now, you know, you you were sighted then, but it's kind of the same thing. You're, you're seeing another dimension. You're seeing something that most people just glance over or, or don't notice, right? That's an excellent point, by the way, James. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. But it was, it was just, that's what I thought about that patch of grass. And I just thought Arthur was thinking the same way. He's how many people walk past that patch of grass that day? <laughs> you, you bet. You bet. Did Arthur ever think about writing a song about that patch of grass? I don't know. I don't know. I never asked him, but I will ask him. <laughs> well, tell him, tell him I suggested it, okay? I will. I will tell him. <laughs> I can be sure I will. Yeah, but that was wonderful. And then you sort of, sort of wind it up with what you call your big party. And now... <laughs> Now we get really interesting uh, because you name, you talk about this party and it's, it's your party. Yeah. And the guests are just fabulous because not all of them are living and not all of them are people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> could you, could you tell our listeners who, what was this party about? This party, the uh, invitation list, was extremely long, going into the thousands. But the fundamental idea I was trying to set out was that we're all one. We're all connected, all these myriad of people. I think what I was getting from it was it was just such a cross-section of people and things that had impacted your life, going back to Bub. Yeah, other grandma, right? You bet. Uh, your dad, your second dad, your third dad, David Rockefeller, right? All these folks. 
there was a, I think, a sewing machine thrown in there as well. <laughs> My grandmother's singer sewing machine. <laughs> Not to mention all this treasure trove of learning. All the characters from your learning were, were all at this party. What a party, man. I would have loved to have been there. <laughs> well, now well that you, yeah, now that you've met me, uh, Sandy, can I come to that party too? I, I will make sure that when we have the next big one, which will be bigger than this one, you'll be invited. <laughs> so yeah, that, so these are all people who really impacted your life. But it's also a testament to your gratitude. I so admire you, Sandy, for what you have done. And I know you're a humble, grateful man. And that makes you just an even more incredible person. You know, you're getting me, I'm getting emotional because you're just an amazing man. I really, you really are. I, I appreciate it very much. Well, I obviously don't agree with you, but nonetheless, I appreciate the comments. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't agree, but <laughs> I, I had to say it anyway. So hypothetical question for you. If you could select a person, whether they're living or dead, let, let's say a person who's no longer living, because you could still see the people who are living, right? So yep. what if, if you could select one of those people who's who's gone now to have lunch with today, who would that be? And what do you think you would ask them or tell them? Well, you'll be disappointed to know that I'd uh, select my grandmother. I'm not disappointed at all. As a matter of fact, I had a feeling that's who it was going to be. <laughs> uh, tell us why. And what, what do you think you'd say to her? What would you ask her? I, I'd ask her, what was it like to travel life virtually alone with one eye and no underline, no resources from pogroms to Buffalo? How, how did you do it? What was in you that enabled you to do it? A Herculean effort, to say the least. How did you do it? I couldn't have done it. No question about it. But see, that's the point I made at the outset. These people I grew up with, they didn't have to give me any sermons or lectures. I just saw the way they lived. And there it was. You, you got an education of enormous importance, understand words like decency and goodness and hard work and take care of your neighbor. Mm. So th that's, I guess I'd say that's my, my biggest break in life was growing up with these people and seeing what all the virtues we read about a really like. Sandy, it's, uh, I think we all, I reflect upon it. I think we all have that, that list of guests at our party, right? We all do. I think it's very important. And your, and your book has, has sort of highlighted it for me. Very important that we sort of take stock of who would be at that party and why they're there and how they impacted us and what we can learn from them. What, what, how did they pour into our lives? We are, we are really who we are today because of who's at that party. You bet. You know? That's a very, very excellent point. Right there, that sentence. And I'm going to start making my list after I reread that chapter again, because it's just so fascinating <laughs> to me. And uh, I won't even get into how you talk about future generations because it is so profound and so interesting. People just have to get the book to read it. It is just amazing. I wanted to touch base to, with something very important that you talk about in your epilogue. Right around the, the time that you were dealing with your challenges, with your, you know, losing your eyesight and you know, going back to going back to Columbia and all the things you had to face you there, John F. Kennedy had become president. And he makes a statement that the, he's going to put a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. And I know that sort of struck you, that sort of stayed with you. And that sort of moved on in your life and inspired you to do something with regard to blindness. Could you talk about that and what you and your wife, Sue, did? Yeah, sure. 
blindness has been afflicting humanity and of course our bipedal ancestors as well for six million years, perhaps a little longer. I don't have to tell you what blindness is really like. You can you could figure it out pretty quickly. This century is the first time since those millennia ago that we have a chance of ending this crushing monster. And it occurred to me when I accepted the chairmanship of the John Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute in 2010, and it began opening my eyes to see where did the science stand. A couple of years later, Sue and I decided to award a certain amount of money to those scientists who did most to help end blindness. And we gave the awards in December of 2020, 13 most distinguished scientists around the world from every continent. John Hopkins asked Sue and me if we would lend our name to something called the Sanford and Susan Greenberg Center to End Blindness. And we recognize that there is no other facility in the world dedicated solely to ending blindness for everyone forevermore. And we have jumped on that, and that is going to be our life mission that we will somehow end blindness for everyone. Mm. It's, it's that time when there has been so much progress in the scientific world, in ophthalmology, in the neurosciences. And I doubt very much that this will be accomplished before we have finished our journey. But nonetheless, it's still very important. And I'm hoping beyond hope that before the end of the century, blindness will be vanquished from every single place in the world. Well, thank God for, for what you're doing, the work that you and, and your wife have been doing, and uh, the many other researchers who are out there looking to end blindness. So important. You know, my prayers are that there's going to be some big advances soon. I really hope. We've had a, two other guests on our show who had lost their, their eyesight. One was from birth. The other one, when he was about six years old. And their stories are, you know, they're just amazing stories. And each one of them has done their share of, of work in that field to help others who may be in the process of losing their sight or who have lost their sight. So thank you for what you're doing. And on a personal level, what do you want people, a person who's going to pick up your book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, what do you want them to walk away with? What thought do you want them to come away with? Well, I would say the notion, the importance of friendship and love. In part, I knew when I wrote this book, there aren't a lot of books that show the kind of love that exists between Arthur and me. There are cynical people who may make other interpretations, but I can't be concerned about them. I'm hoping that love will come to, to everyone in, in different forms, but that's the one big blessing we all can have in this life. And my story is simply one of friendship and love. Amen to that, Sandy. I mean, that it hits home. It hit home with me. It's got that message, friendship and love, but it's got so many other things in it as well. I've learned, I learned a lot of things. I like to learn now. As a matter of fact, I'm more interested in learning now than I was when I was in college, frankly. <laughs> and I see you have loads of books behind you. Um, I'm a book person. And I, I enjoy learning, but you've got such a wide array of interests and things, but people and friendships and uh, the importance of helping one another are just so paramount in what you're doing, the work that you're doing, uh, you and your wife. So, by the way, she must, she must be an amazing person. I would love to meet her someday because uh, she walked with you all along that process and 
you're blessed with a with a beautiful family as well. But I want to thank you so much for being on our show. I want to urge people to get your book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, How Daring Dreams and Unyielding Friendship Turned One Man's Blindness into an Extraordinary Vision for Life. Fantastic book. Your friend Art Garfunkel wrote the introduction, and you also had the foreword written by another friend of yours, uh, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And final word was written by Margaret Atwood. Just a wonderful book. And thanks again, Sandy, for being on our show. Thanks, James, for having me. A pleasure being with you. I hope you have a great day, Sandy. Keep up the good work. Will do. Thank you, James, so very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YH. YS podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.